Hi, everyone. Let's get started. Welcome to the wrong slide. <laughs> Welcome to the February meetup for Minnesota After Effects user group. Uh, we're very privileged and lucky today to have Caitlin here, who is uh, an awesome person along with a great animator. And we'll be walking through her cell animation workflow. And I, I will let her talk more about herself. Uh, I won't. Uh, spoil it too much. So for tonight, uh, a few things going on. We're going to really briefly talk about what's new in After Effects. Uh, spoiler alert, not a whole lot <laughs> right now. We're going to do our quick tips. We'll get into Caitlin. Uh, we're going to go over our prompt submissions. Only had two come in. If anybody has more uh, for the prompt, feel free to drop a link in the chat, and we'll bring it up when we get there. Uh, show and tell, so if anybody has any problems they want to work through or any uh, thing they want feedback on or just a cool thing that they did that they want to show off, we'll go over that. And at the very end, we'll talk uh, about our Time Lord and Creative Cloud prizes. What's not on here is I'm going to talk about the next meetup and uh, in March. The reason it's not here is because you just got it <laughs> kind of formed today. So it's a, a brand new thing. So real quick, first, what's new in After Effects? 17.7 came out uh, this last few weeks ago. Um, what's in it? We got bug fixes. That That's it. That That's that's all we got. And 17.7, .7, not a whole lot going on. We will drop a link uh, at the summary so you can take a look at all the bug fixes. There are actually, actually are quite a few. Uh, but last month, we actually got 17.6. So After Effects is doing a lot of updates now, which is great. Um, two main changes there from a feature perspective. One, uh, or that if you work with red files, some of the color space management has changed. Um, Adobe has a write-up on that. But basically, if you know what these things mean, that might be important to you. If you don't know what these things mean, probably doesn't matter, and, and don't worry about it. The other new feature that they added was a more accurate content to wear a fill. And what this has is actually adaptive lighting correction. And so if you look at these two, uh, this is the old content to wear fill, and you see this kind of hazy shadow uh, right here in the bottom right that, I mean, the lens flare goes away. You got these weird edges. New content to wear fill, you still got some edges, and the lens flare um, kind of disappears, but it's much more subtle. So uh, content to wear fill is one of those things that's magic to me. I don't understand it, but it's amazing when it works right. <laughs> so check it out if you haven't uh, already. So that's it for what's new. Uh, we're going to jump right into our quick tips. So we got three people tonight. Lucas is going to talk about uh, an expression for triggering something to happen in a marker. Tara is going to talk about uh, using the speed graph. And if you don't use it already, you should. Uh, it can be a little unwieldy, but Tara will show us her secrets. And then David is going to talk about something that's tangentially related to After Effects, which is using Remix to adjust song length in After Effects. <clears throat> we're going to let people go. So Lucas, you are up if you'd like to grab the screen. So um, this is a pretty, it's kind of a, uh, just sharing one expression that I use a lot. Um, something that I do a lot is UI animation. And so um, all the time I'm having a, a cursor, you know, perform an, an interaction. And usually the way that I show it is just to kind of uh, take the scale and have the mouse click down, and, and that's the interaction of showing what a click is. And so, um, you know, I would, uh, before I, I use the expression, I would go through and I would just copy and paste my scale keyframes um, across every time I'd have a mouse click. Um, just it's the same animation over and over, just copying and pasting all the time. So that there must be a way to make that a little bit easier. Um, and so I found an expression that just so you can find it, um, here's a QR code. So I don't know if you want to snap a picture of that, but that'll give you a link to uh, just a Google uh, doc that I use for all of my commonly, frequently used expressions. Um, and the one that's at the very top, just because I use it all the time, is trigger animation at a marker. And so I'm sure I found it somewhere from someone at one time. Um, I'm sorry I can't credit that person because um, it's been years. But but that's uh, that's the expression there. And basically, all you do is you find the uh, parameter that you want to have triggered, 
and you put all your keyframes starting at frame zero. So for this one, I just had the, the scale animate here at, from frame zero. And then anytime I want that animation to happen, um, I put a marker on that layer. And so I go to that layer, um, go to that marker, and it's as if I'm copying and pasting my keyframes um, over and over. But instead, all I'm doing is adding a marker. Um, and this could be, you know, you could put this expression on any number of layers. So you could do, um, you know, 10 different parameters that are all animated from a marker. And then you're not, you're not you know, copying and pasting and moving things around. I, I will admit that that's an uh, expression I copy and paste in there as well. It's super, super handy. So we'll post a link to Lucas's Google Doc in the end, and, or maybe not in time for people to see here, but with the summaries. And we'll post it on our Facebook group and Discord group. So you will be able to have a link uh, if you miss that QR code really quickly. All right. So looks like we got Tara. You're next. Perfect. Uh, so I'm going to talk really quickly about the speed graph and specifically how you can understand like the curve relations and what that means for your animation. Because I feel like when people struggle with the speed graph, like the biggest hump is just like figuring out what does my curve mean. Um, so here we have just a simple back and forth animation. You can see that we have linear keys. There's no easing. If I were to open up the speed graph and take a look, I can see that it's a straight line. How about that? Uh, and if we were taking a look at like the motion path that's happening here, we can also see that the timing is very evenly paced. If we were to go and apply just a basic easy ease with no adjustments, we can see that in the speed graph, that's a curved. Um, it's no longer straight line. It, the shape is more of a half semicircle. And if we take a look at the motion path up here, we can see that because we have easy ease, because we're easing in and out of these two keyframes, that our motion path is now offset. So there's more frames, more tweens near these two keyframes. The center's still kind of evenly paced, but we can see that you know the timing's a little bit offset now. And if we were to click on these handles, we can see that they're pulled a little bit away from our keyframes. They're kind of getting towards the middle, but they're not too far. They are definitely closer to our keyframes than they are the middle of the curve. So let's take a look at an adjusted easy ease. Here I have my motion path. I've made the path into a mountain's peak. If we play this animation, we can see that in our motion path, we have much more tweens, more frames, again, near those two keyframe points. There is some stuff happening in the middle. If we take a look at our handles, we can see that our handles are closing that center peak. But there's more frames, more tweens happening at the ends. So then if we take that one step further, and we can see in this motion path, there's barely any frames. What do we think that will affect our graph? If we open up our graph and do the playback, we can see that we have a drastic peak. If I pull up the keyframes, we can see that those handles are practically touching in the middle. So when you want dynamic snappy motion, you need to try and get away from a straight line. You want to have a peaked curve. Uh, and then the more frames, the more tweens that you have at the ends of your keyframes, the more ease you have and the further your handles are going to be towards the center of that curve. So that's me. I'm going to stop presenting now. All right. Thanks, Tara. Yeah, the speed graph is one of those things that when you first open it up, it can be very confusing. Even if you've been using After Effects for 10 years, you're like, I still don't quite know what that spike means. And it, uh, it it's really useful to play with that more and really know, understand what that means. So awesome. Thank you. All right. Last up, we have David, who's going to show us some sound stuff. Cool. Uh, can you hear me? I was having troubles with my mic earlier. Yep, we hear you. Awesome. Um, 
Awesome. So this is something I've been using a lot lately. Um, just because it's really quick, I'll say what this is really good for is if you need to retime an interview edit or something that's really, um, you know, the, the music really isn't the main focal point. Um, it's just kind of a backing track or like in this case, uh, in my job, I've been doing like some depth, like really simple click through demos. Um, someone screen records and I add in a little mouse and kind of a little highlighted thing. Um, I'm going to totally steal your expression for mouse clicks from now on, Lucas, because uh, that's incredible. Um, <clears throat> but it's really nice if you want to use like the same music for something, or if you have like a 30 second edit and you need to quickly make it a 45 second edit. So generally what I'll do is I'll export uh, ProRes from After Effects and then do all my audio work in Premiere. Um, but I've got three different ones here. They're, you know, ranging from two minutes to, you know, a minute and a little over a minute. Um, and the best way that I've found to do it, you can drag your audio in and do the right click and edit clip in Adobe Edition. I feel like that gets really messy with all your files and it starts saving files in different random places. Um, so what I like to do is I just go directly into Audition and just start a new multi-track session and we'll just call this da, 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 da. there we go you just save it wherever you want to and then if you bring in your music what you can do is you can just drag your music track in and then down over here in the properties panel this is just the default Adobe Audition. I haven't done anything with it, but you might have your media browser open when you first open. Um, if you go into properties and then select your track and enable remix, it'll analyze. And then what you can do is take it and say, okay, well, this is a three minute track and I've got a two minute edit. You can just type in the time that you want and it'll get it kind of close um and it does a pretty good job like i said for background tracking it's like if the music isn't perfect it's not a big deal if you're timing things to beats and you're like really making sure your motion is really timed to your beats i wouldn't use this at all um but then the last thing i'll say really quick is before i export um i'll kind of like find out where this last big beat is when it starts to fade out and then I'll go into Premiere and I'll be like, okay, well, for this two minute edit, I know that the like this comes up right at 154. And over here, oh, perfect, 154. So then I kind of know like that's gonna time out and fade out pretty nicely uh, with the ending of my animation. Um, and I usually just kind of export with media encoder, um, you know, select what you want. Uh, waveform you know and then it just automatically brings it through media encoder which is super nice and again you can just send it to premiere and render directly into premiere but it doesn't like keep file structures really nice and i'm really ocd with that um it doesn't uh um it just kind of names it like random tracks and stuff like that so you can like name each of your edits and then uh you won't be able to hear it but um you know, then you have a nicely timed audio piece where the audio isn't something that's like the main focus of your piece. It's really nice for like animatics or interviews. If you've got like a like a three minute interview that's suddenly, oh, we need to cut it down to a minute and a half because we've got uh, edits or something like that. So that's that. If I can expand on that for one point, I've had a lot of people say, I bring it into Audition and the enable remix button isn't on. You did mention this, but it's very important to remember that you need to like click and select your audio file. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, to our quick tip presenters. That's, uh, I always appreciate people volunteering their their time uh, and, and knowledge to be able to. Uh, share with us. So thank you, Lucas, Tara, and David. All right. So now we'll go to the main event, which we have Caitlin here, who, if you haven't uh, seen her already, she's uh, fairly active on Twitter. 
on a few other social uh, areas. No, I'm taking a break from Twitter, man. Sometimes. Okay, Twitter break. So don't look for Caitlin on Twitter. I am there though. I'm just trying to ignore it. You know, <laughs> y'all know why. It's Twitter. It's Twitter. Uh, <laughs> social media, it's good for us, right? Yeah, historically <laughs> I've been on there too much, so. Uh, yeah. I feel you for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm going to let Caitlin introduce herself. Uh, she's going to show us some cell animation workflow that she works on. And she's uh, been very kind to volunteer her time for us. And Caitlin, I will let you take it away. Hello. It's my pleasure, really. Um, I hope it's helpful because I'm going to footnote at the beginning of this whole thing, this workflow, I invented it because I prefer to do it all in Procreate now primarily because I love it so much but like procreate isn't built to like have a really really advanced cell situation happening so I'm definitely pushing it I feel really good about it I hope that procreate will continue to advance their tools as well so like a lot of my workflow is like here's how I get around this thing that like procreate doesn't really want you to do this but it, none of it's that complicated I hope I don't think so um so now, where should I begin? Well, I want to show, I don't think I'll show the whole thing. It's only a minute long, but I'll show this piece that I worked on uh, over the holiday. Let me share my screen um, because I kind of just did it as like a fun personal project. And it was basically all sell and procreate and then run through Photoshop and then finished in After Effects. Can you see, are you seeing this? We are seeing your screen, yes. Okay, there's, I don't use Google, we're on Google Meet, right? Yeah, this is all new for me. Um, so this is it, I guess I can full screen this, but I'll just like skip through, but like all of the art I did for this was done in Procreate. Um, it's basically animated to a minute long clip from a podcast that I really like. So I thought that would be a fun project to test this out on. If you, I don't know if you guys are into podcasts, but it's Rude Tales of Magic. It's like an improv d, &D podcast. It's really good. I like it a lot. I highly recommend it. Um, it's really funny and it's great. And so this was like a stream of consciousness, like weird improv thing that one character did in the middle of the show like has nothing to do with anything that goes on in the show but he's just describing all of this weird stuff like a crocodile with marshmallow teeth and like birds you know getting the marshmallows and like all of this stuff so i just thought that would be really fun to play around with so i didn't have anything else going on um and so yeah all of this for the most part is like different little cell things that i did in procreate and i stitched it all together via the computer. So I'll show a little bit of kind of my overall process. And you know, if there's anything in particular that anybody wants to see more of, you can also do that. So let's see if I can get my iPad going. Sorry, this is my hacky workaround to like OBS screencast my iPad screen. So it takes a minute to like get it unstuck. And we should be good. Whoop. Okay. So this is Procreate. So this isn't anything that I did for that project, but it was, this is also like a Rude Tales of Magic, like fan art thing that I did because I was on a roll. And this was another cool thing where the guy was like, this character is like all these skulls and is like morphing between all these different types of skulls and he's talking. And I was like, that's really cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a line from that podcast and I'm going to try to like old school Disney cell animation style, like time it out to VO because you can't import audio tracks into Procreate. And so I was like, well, this would be a fun challenge. It's like, can I time the audio right? Uh, so what I did, oh, can I show this? This feels like, I don't know, I like it feels very simple. And at the same time, I really can't believe that it worked. I just took the audio clip that I wanted to time it to. <laughs> and uh, I dropped it into After Effects. And then I like put markers where the audio like beats were. And I just like literally counted the frames individually and wrote them down in my planner. And I used that to like do the timing. I wonder if I still have that in here. It might not. 
Uh, oh, I totally do. Ha ha. So as you can see, uh, yeah, it's just straightforward, like listening to this, like scrubbing the timeline to kind of hear that. I don't think you can hear any of this stuff. That's fine. I can't hear it either, actually. Um, but I just, you know, oh, like I know he's going to say like he's going to finish this word here. Or, you know, this is the last thing he says. It ends it on this hard T sound and there's nothing here. So it was just stuff where I knew like the lips are going to like make contact and they need to. This was also harder because it's literally a skull. So it's literally just open and shut uh, or maybe easier. I don't know. Uh, so I just like counted all of these out and I wrote them down and then I took them into. Whoop, OK, we're still good. Procreate. And this is my like very basic setup for this which I'm gonna play really quickly. And then I'll just kind of show you like the basics of animating in Procreate. But you can see there's a timeline at the bottom. All of the drawings, there's basically like, I want like seven or eight drawings here probably. And um, they're just these like the white, the bright white ones here at the bottom. Those are like the drawings. And then with Procreate, you can uh, put holds on the frames. Hopefully this is easy to see. I feel like it's tiny, but... Uh, so this was just like a way to get basic timing was like, you know, this is going to be this where he's like kss, this kss sound. And I know it needs to last. It needs to hold on this for like 11 frames. So I can just put in one placeholder drawing for that and then click this and like add another 10 frames in the whole duration. And so this was just for me to look at it and be like, OK, what exactly is going on here? Like how many frames do I need to have in each little section? And like how much, you know, movement do I want to have? Do I want to have him like look up to emphasize a certain syllable or something like that? Um, uh, yeah, I guess I'm going to start from scratch too while I'm in here just to show you the basics of like setting this stuff up in the first place. Um, I like to work in square. We can work in a square here. So it's pretty simple to get started. This is what I like about Procreate so much. And I'll, ho you know, hopefully they keep advancing uh, what's possible in here. But I got my canvas, I got stuff going on. So I want to make this a, an animation instead of just like a static drawing. And that's just up here in the wrench. And then in the canvas settings, there's the animation assist. And that's pretty much all you have to do to get that started. Then it, it adds just one frame. Then I can go down to the bottom right and the timeline that you get and add a frame. And you can see it's already like onion skinning, which is cool. And then like add another frame. And we're already going and I'll play it. And it's happening. So another cool thing that I really like about this is that you can just like change all the playback settings pretty easily. So I can really quickly just like have like, I need it to be a million frames a second, which you, I don't recommend. But like, if you want to, you know, maybe I want to animate this really simply. So I won't do 24 frames. I won't do 12 frames. I'll do eight frames a second. And that gives you kind of a nice look with obviously now I don't have to do 24 drawings. I can just do eight drawings and have an animation happening, you know, to take up one second of time. Most of the time I work in 24 or 12. But one thing I also like is like, if I want to do 24 frames a second, which is maybe what I'll have the finished video come out in, then I can still just like add a single hold to each frame. And that way I, I still only have to draw 12 drawings. And if I want to go in and like backfill more drawings in between to add detail, I can do that. It just gives you, there's a lot of like really minute control over your timing in Procreate. That's very easy to me. If you don't, I am between Cintiqs or like uh, tablet monitors at the moment. And if that's something that you don't have, I feel like a lot of designers have access to an iPad or interest in getting an iPad Pro, like that kind of a thing. I mean, Cintiqs are a gajillion dollars. I used to have one and I loved it to death, but they don't work super well on it. Like I constantly run into problems with the drivers and all of it. It's like a never ending issue. So it's been, I've been really hesitant to, to get that. So I feel like this is a little bit more accessible in a lot of ways. And then uh, caveat, I've not used Time Lord, the new app-ish plugin thing for Photoshop to make cell animation out of Photoshop easier. And I don't really work in Animate. Those both seem really cool, 
again, like don't have the tablet either. So it's just not a viable option for me. So this is a great way I found to get started with this kind of thing. Um, so I'm going to delete this forever. Uh, and to get back into kind of, I guess, finishing this over time, I was just duplicating these projects essentially for my own, uh, just so I don't like screw anything up, basically. I was just like versioning. So I would just, you know, every time I wanted to move on to another step, I would just like select this layer and duplicate it and start picking it up again. And that's kind of convenient that I have all of these like process uh, ones. But so like on my next project file, you can see that I started actually doing more of the design part and still and like maybe adding a few more drawings here and there to like advance the timing. Uh, where am I going to skip to next? This one's probably good. And then, yeah, as it just keep going and you just keep filling in more. So what I would be doing is like in the in the very first, like early super sketchy stages, I had all of these like gray hold frames where there's nothing in there. As I kept drawing, I, you know, now I know if I'm going from like he, like the S sound to the ER sound, I know there's like five frames there that I need to add actual like individual drawings for to keep the timing. So then I can just kind of delete those holds and add more actual drawings and then, you know, just kind of a push and pull with that. I also, um, I numbered these at the bottom, in the bottom right. Keep pointing with my like stylus and like you definitely can't see that. Uh, but this just kind of like helped me know not only the timing, I guess, it was also kind of a morale thing so I could count how many drawings I had left to go. <laughs> it looks like a lot, but like once you're in a flow, I don't feel like it's too bad. This whole animation probably took me like a few nights to like from start to finish. Uh, and then this is the kind of stuff that I'm going to show you how I put together the final in After Effects because this is, you know, the, the final cleaned up version. I've got, uh, I guess, four layers. This is kind of a... This is a relic before that I didn't use. Like I tried one type of line art. You didn't like it. I ended up taking it out, but I just left them in there <laughs> for whatever reason. But like then the final product, I have like a fill layer. I have like this one detail. I have this extra kind of line art detail and then these shadows. And you can see that I have a bunch of groups in Procreate and they all have those. So that's like, the thing about Procreate for cell animation is there are not multiple timelines. There's not, if you're if you're doing any kind of cell animation in Photoshop, you can create a video timeline and it like has all of these different tracks that can be anim like animated one on top of the other. And it's easy to keep things separate and not like mess anything up. And Procreate doesn't have that. It operates in this kind of counterintuitive way, maybe initially. So, when you're in the early stages, back here maybe, you have your timeline and every single layer is a frame. I'm already using groups in here, but every single layer is a frame. So anytime I add a new layer, it's just the frame and that's fine. But if I wanna uh, fill something in, it can get a little weird. So if I'm going to do animation assist and do a little guy. And then I'm like, oh, I love this line art. It looks so good. This is really professional. Now I want to color this ball red, but I want it on its own layer so I can change that color later if I want to, or, you know, put an effect on it or something. So I'll like, I'll add another layer. And it's like, no, you won't. Cause now there's like a gap. And so that's I'm like, oh, okay. What am I going to do? The answer is to put that in a group. And then once that's in a group, it's now its own layer again, its own frame again. So we're back to like our three little balls. And then that way I can take this guy, and put him on top where he belongs and make this red on its own layer. And it stays together. So again, if you like wasn't in this group, it would just separate those. And then we'd have like one red frame. So then if I want 
this ball to be red on every single layer. I have to, you know, make all of these its own group. But then I can add as many layers as I want inside that group and have it stay together. So honestly, the like the name of this game really ultimately is just planning ahead as much as possible and then just trying to keep things organized, um, which is great because that's how most animation is, I think. So once you've sort of got the workflow ironed out, it's pretty easy to stick to. Uh, so I'm gonna take this, this specific file and put it into Photoshop and show you kind of how I get it from there into After Effects where it can be fully done. So I already um, uploaded this to Photoshop. Oh, there's one thing I wanted to talk about really quickly. Another issue that uh, Procreate has is like layer amount in a file. So like the bigger a file you make, like literally physically and in terms of resolution, hopefully it'll tell you because I don't know if there's an, a simple way to show that. Um, so I just made a square, it's like 2048 by 2048. And if I go to resize it and like make it huge, 5,000 by 5,000, it says at the top really briefly how many layers you have. I don't know why it doesn't stay longer. Um, I'll do that one more time just to see if I can show it. So yeah, it, has, it says 124 layers right now with this size of file. And then if I want to make this bigger so I can add like way more detail, it's down to 17 layers. So I can literally only make 17 layers in this file before it's like you can't make any more layers anymore, uh, which is not great, especially if I want to make this an animation, I can only have like 17 frames. And it counts layers inside of groups too. So that can really shortchange you. So something that I've run into on a bunch of projects where I've done this is I literally just don't have the frame space in a file to keep adding the frame. So you'll see like these two, uh, oh, this isn't even like fitting on here anymore. I'm gonna get rid of that. Um, but these two here at the end, these are both the finals. I just had to split it into two different Procreate files to get it to fit. So that's why it's like A and B and I have like, uh, 40 frames in this one and then like the other 40 or so in the B file and I just stitch it all together into one Photoshop file when I'm finalizing it. Um, so it's just something you can't really plan for specifically because it depends on how big your canvas is and all of this different stuff but it's not too hard to split those into different layers. So in Photoshop, I just, you know, save this to Dropbox from Procreate and then open it up in Photoshop. Like you can just export it from Procreate as a PSD. And now I have all my groups in here and they got all the, the layers. So I want to turn this into a, a frame animation. Hmm. There's, I don't have to do it in a super complicated way. The, the way that I'm about to show you how I do that is this is so I can preserve each individual layer in case I want to adjust it in After Effects. So maybe I'll show a simple way first. It's just like, you don't really need to get any, you know, super crazy. Um, but you have to start with creating a video timeline and always make sure that you come over here to this little hamburger thing to change the frame rate. And it, you probably won't have timeline open, but if you go to window, it is in the T, it's timeline right here. And then that will give you the, the ability to make cell and frame animations in Photoshop. So I have all my groups. I am going to make this a 24 frame per second thing. This can get really weird if you try to change it later. So again, it's just like knowing what you're getting into and uh, yeah, you, basically if you have to change this later, you should probably just reopen the file and start over from scratch because it gets weird. Uh, so I'll change this to 24 now. It always defaults to 30. I don't know if there's a way to change that. If you know, please let me know. <laughs> uh, so I have all my groups. I'm actually curious. I don't think I've tried it with groups before, but I'm gonna see if I can adjust the group lengths with this really quickly. It might not work. 
Okay, I think it will work actually. So what I'm using in Photoshop to treat this is, yes, it's animators toolbar. I do use the pro version. I think there's an unpaid version, but I honestly am not sure what the difference is or if there's even like a free version still available. It's been a while, but it's like 20 bucks. And I've used it for actual animation in here, but really right now I'm using it as like a cleanup tool for my layers. Otherwise it's just gonna get kind of tedious. Um, oh, you're gonna do this anyway. Oops. Sorry guys, I, I done did this to myself. I didn't think this would happen. Be careful what you do in this. It's This is animation, I guess. Maybe I'll just like uh, nuke this from orbit. I don't know if that's gonna work. Stay tuned, folks. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm about to be real aggressive on this. I love the phrase "nuke this from orbit." <laughs> it sounds so extreme. <laughs> I gotta and kill it, this program. It, it testifies to the amount of work that goes into cell animation. <laughs> It's so true. And like, once it goes rogue, sometimes you're like, I just have to take care of this before it gets out of hand. Okay, so I'll create my video timeline again. None of that even happened. I'll set my timeline frame rate to 24 frames. Okay. And I need basically to be able to get all of my layers out of these groups. And then I need to trim those to be two frames in length each, and then I need to string them out into a timeline. And I need to do that for every single individual, like all of these layers that are fill layers need to have that happen individually. I have all my groups. So I like to open all my groups together. I'm on a PC, so it's like if I hold control and I click the um, toggle arrow, it opens all the groups or it closes them which is just really nice. If you have a ton of groups like this, it can get kind of ugly. Uh, so another thing about planning is all of my types of layers are in the same place in the stack. So that means like every single fill layer that is like this white, like cream fill color, they're all always the bottom layer in the group. And that makes it really easy for me to get it where I want it to go because I'm basically just going to literally scroll through all of these groups and select all of these layers individually. Oh, we get into animation because it's tedious, right guys? <laughs> I kind of like this though. It's a little bit meditative, but maybe not palpably thrilling. Okay, so I have all of this cream filled layers selected. And I'm going to, I think, control shift and uh, the right bracket on the key. I'm going to post that in the chat. Uh. Mm. That um, pulls all of the layers out of the groups. And all the groups are still down here at the bottom. And all of my cream layers are out on top. So they're still not in their own. Um, uh oh, they're not in their own, like they need to be in one layer. They're all stacked on top of each other now. I'm also noticing now that my animators toolbar is like not functional. Let's try this again. There we go. Minor glitch. Um, so I can go one frame down because we're starting at zero. So if I go one frame down, and I have this layer 165 highlighted and I go up and there's this little bracket on animators toolbar and I click that and it's gonna take it down to two frames. So I'm gonna undo that really quickly because you can just do all of these simultaneously. So I'll go one frame down again, scroll down and like highlight every single one of these frames, click it. And it does it automatically. And then I can, holding down, no, not holding down, shift, holding down control. But you basically select all of the layers except for this bottom one. And I can drag them into that. 
and it'll string it out for me. It's very nice. And that makes it a little bit less tedious. <laughs> so now you can, if I play it back with the space bar, all of those are strung out on their own. Caitlin, I know you can't see the, the people while you're presenting it. I just want to let you know there was a collective wow across <laughs> some of the screens. Oh, well, that's awesome. I hope this is helpful. Like, this is the stuff that I do alone in my apartment. I hope people. And that's it for Caitlin, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> like where that's a wrap for me. Um, I'm not going to go ahead and do the rest of these layers. There's no need for that. But I will just show you kind of what it looks like put together in After Effects. So here's my guy in his final form. Ooh, no, we're turning the sound off. It's very unnerving. But you can see it on my Instagram if you want to. Uh, people kept telling me it's really creepy, so I feel like that's a very high compliment. So I didn't do the audio, but still. Um, but yeah, this is the final, and I actually did two quote-unquote versions of it. It's just color swaps because I couldn't decide which one I liked better because this character is like in a desert location. So I, you know, I wanted to do the deserty look and I just didn't like it. But what was great about having the, uh, all these detail layers on different layers in Photoshop is like, I have them all separate so I can change the colors of any of these individual ones and not have to worry about uh, it like just putting a fill layer and it's all on one layer. So then the whole thing is like, whatever. Um, there's one workaround that's a really simple thing that I'll show you for that, but it's nice. Like I have the line art all on one layer, so it's all in here and that's just cool. It gives me more flexibility. I don't know if in case I wanted to put a weird effect on this or something like that, or, uh, I think on some of these layers, yeah, I ended up using a gradient to fill in the shadow layer, just to add, it's like super subtle, but just something, not a straight fill. And then that doesn't mess with anything else. Like for this one, I made him a little darker and like a little bit light on the outside. Uh, but that is basically how you do it. And now he's in here uh, and I'll show you that bigger project that I worked on. I can show you anything in here if you want. And this is such a small thing that I'm about to show you specifically. But one thing that you can do in Procreate really easily is if you have black line art, you can drag a color into that. Like if I draw a solid black circle, uh, I can just drop a color into that on the same layer and it'll stay. And that's really nice. What is not nice about that, like, is the lack of control you have later. So then I can't like take that individual fill layer and do anything to it because it's attached to the line art. It's like physically on the same layer. But I liked it for something like, I have this cloud burst somewhere in here. It's right there, okay. I just gotta find, woof, man. This, I can't believe I did this in Procreate, honestly. There's a lot of stuff. Okay, I'm just gonna find him this way. I know you're in here. Okay, so this is just, that's how I did this because it was a lot of bits and pieces and I didn't wanna spend a ton of time like tracing every single cloud that I did and then like manually filling it in in Procreate. That's a lot to do. So for this one, they're all in the same layer. Oops, you can see the line art. Um, but this is great because then I can just put an adjustment layer an adjustment layer on it and um put the tint effect on and so the tint effect just lets me if there's white in it i can change the white to anything and not change the line art so that's super convenient if you have something that's only black and white but you know you want to be able to change that white color then i don't have to worry about and i can also change the line art if i want to and make it something weird uh, but that's cool. So that's just what I did because I didn't know, you know, what's going to be the best looking color to have this in here. This was like a last minute sort of addition to this. So I could play around and be like, I want it to be green or yellow or whatever. Yeah, that's it in a nutshell. If there is anything I can specifically show, I will do that.
but I, that's all I got officially. Yes, I actually have a quick question, Caitlin. What okay. uh, what's your best way of moving from Photoshop to After Effects? Do you just open up the Photoshop file, or do you export? Oh, that's a good. I mean. Choice? No, so this is where, honestly, I probably should use Time Lord for this, I feel like, but I just haven't looked into it. I even, I own it, like I bought it right away because I was like, yes, this is amazing. And someday I'll probably own a Cintiq again, or I, maybe, but I haven't used it and I don't really know how it works. So I pretty much just, um, I just like file save as and import it in After Effects, like the old school way. And it'll come in like, well, I'll look at the other one. Whoop. Yeah, like it'll come in with all the, you know, the layers like usual and then make a the pre-comp. And yeah, like so it comes in kind of ugly sometimes with like the video group. And for these that were just like process where I was just kind of checking to see how it looked, that I didn't really mind that, but I basically just, yeah, save it out of Photoshop and just drop it right in without thinking about it much. But what I think is nice for people to know is that if you have a, an animation timeline in Photoshop, in a Photoshop document, it looks like that carries through to After Effects without like exporting every single frame. Yes, that's a good, so it puts it in a group, and but then it takes all of these. And my understanding is that it, yeah, like it, it the whole layer is there it just trims it to what you specified in Photoshop, which is kind of interesting. Cause like in Photoshop, it looks like, oh, I just have each layer is just like a two frame bit and it doesn't exist anywhere else in the thing. After Effects does interpret it correctly, which is awesome. It just drops all of your layers in the timeline and then snips them where you had it in Photoshop. But it's pretty cool. It does a lot of the work for you. And then if I had done this to completion, then I would have like four different video groups as layers and you would import that and they would just be uh, instead of, no, instead of one video group, it would have four video groups in here. And then you could go into each one individually and mess around with it. So that's basically what like these comps are, are those video groups from the final version of the Photoshop file. Caitlin out. <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, for everyone else, you know, speak now or forever hold your peace. Uh, if you have any questions for Caitlin, uh, pipe in or drop something in the chat. If if you don't feel like, uh, I see a raised you know, hand. It's also cool. You know, I did um, while we're waiting for some of that. I did pop uh, some links in there for uh, Procreate. Uh, animator t animators toolbar and then uh, the direct link to Caitlin's post uh, for this project on Instagram. So you can take a look at all of those. I think Angel has a question. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. All right. I was <laughs> too many buttons. Hey, yeah. <laughs> that was that. super interesting. Uh, I really loved all the information you dropped. I, I, I was oh, like, thank this you. Is yeah, this is great. Um, I'm, I'm personally transitioning, not transitioning, but I've been doing a lot of 3D animation, a lot of uh, After Effects. And uh, I just bought a Cintiq, like one of the entry models. Yeah. Um, I missed that, honestly, but. Well, just because, you know, I just started using PC. But then yeah. I guess, like, I do have a question that is um, uh, maybe not how art, art related, but more like uh, business, the business side of, um, sell animation, like what's the... I might not have an answer for this. <laughs> no? Yeah, like I was expecting because... A lot because, of the stuff you know. I do for fun. Okay. Well, okay. ask your question first, but I will say probably I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, since I just started and then, you know, I, I, I've come across some uh, clients it's like, okay, so this looks really cool, but like how long would it take you to do something like this? Mm. How much? How much? And then, you know, like I, I sometimes I just don't even know. I just started, so... I don't know if you heard, maybe you have other peers or like what's the, if you have an idea of, you know, if this is built the same way, how you build a 3D animation or just like a kinetic text animation. I don't know. That's a great question. I don't know. I will, so I do use cell animation in my work, but it's not, it's just, it's not the same. In large part, I'm not doing these big cell animations. So like I mostly have worked in editorial 
And so like right now I'm working um, on Vox's Netflix show explained. And so they use a ton in every episode of that show. They use a ton of different styles. Like the design style is drastically different from episode to episode. And sometimes we'll use cell anime. I say we, I like haven't been working there that long, but like they yeah. and sort of me have used cell, but it has to be sparingly, but it is the case with that where Sometimes the producers will ask for things that we know we don't have time to deliver. So they'll do that. Like one in particular asks a lot about like, can we have this thing and then have it like morph into this like different thing? And I'm like, no. Hold your <laughs> I mean, horses. You don't want to say that, but like it is kind of that stuff takes a long time. And so that's why we don't usually do it that often. And so I think that's what's tough about Cell is it's so time consuming and I don't know how the price differential would be from like a pure 3D animation. I do know if I was billing for something that was like heavily sell, I would be thinking primarily about the time involved and also being like revisions are basically impossible. Right, right, <laughs> right. Just like client expectations, I think. Yeah, we're like, you don't want to do this because if we get, you know, to the end of this animation, you can't change it. And like I had somebody talk to me once about she worked basically all in cell animation and somebody had asked her for like 13 minutes of animation for a documentary and she was asking me about it and I was like, first of all, don't do it. <laughs> it's like way too much. But second of all, like you just have to tell them up front like you cannot change it it has to be locked down before I start doing this in a significant way. Um, and it's tough because like edit, like documentary, I found like they want to be able to change it at the last minute, I guess, probably just the nature of the beast, like medium, they always are like, it's so easy to switch, swap stuff out. And it probably comes up more too, because I feel like producers like really favor a cell style actually in editorial. I don't know why that is it's just like a documentary thing. It comes up a lot, but like, it's mostly, yeah, p pumping the brakes as much as possible and just being. That's probably why I haven't had a chance to do it a lot, honestly, just because it's a tall order a lot of the time and it's not as flexible. And people like to be able to be like, make it completely the opposite of whatever you made <laughs> tonight. I, I really like your style, uh, like the, the crocodile, the crocodile, and then the whole the alligator crocodile. I'm sorry, I'm 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 I'm, I'm Latino. Uh, I don't know. We say different. I things. mean, I don't know what the difference is, honestly. <laughs> but uh, I like the fluency, and then you know, like how long did it took you to from start to end, to sh like you know where where you said you know like this is enough frames that that's it. Yeah, that's a great question. So I did that project in particular. I'm just gonna pull it up again real quick if i count i lost the here we go um presenting i did this video in a movie y'all over here uh in three weeks start to finish and i wasn't working on it every day but i basically had three weeks of downtime off of Vox, like where nobody is working over the holidays. So I didn't really have anything to do. And I was like, what's gonna be like something fun? Like I never, you know, have time really to work on my own thing. So it's like a rare opportunity. So it's just like something fun I can do. And I had loved this little clip from this show. I just thought it was really cute and it like really lent itself to being animated to me. So I was just like, I'll just make this in the break that I have. So some of it was like, I have to go back to work now. So like, I can't work on this, you know, every day. Um, but even then I wasn't working on it every day, but it was just, it was great to have all that unfiltered time. So somewhere in that like three week range of just working on this, like basically full time. Uh, but I will say too, like storyboarding this, I did it in like a day. And then the rest of it was just figuring it out. It was just a combination of things like it's very easy if you actually like get a chance to watch this and listen to the audio like he's just literally describing all this stuff so it wasn't like taking a lot of imagination on my part to be like is there a crocodile at this part like he <laughs> says crocodile so i'm like okay like i'll do that it's like all these birds and stuff and like them going into the sky so a lot of it was just playing around on my part like i timed it out really roughly I can actually show that too because I should still have the storyboards 
in here, I did an animatic because it felt good to be able to look at it and see like, oh, I have the timing. So now all I have to do is like fill it in, which I guess is the point of an animatic, but I'd never really gotten that far on a personal project before. Uh, and then the rest of it was just like trying to think of stuff that would be fun for me to do. Let's see if I can. Oh, I might. Okay. Sorry, y'all. I'm like really big into versioning. That That's the best thing to do, though. Yeah, I, was like, I think it's good, but then I'm like, where is my stuff? I'm pretty sure it's in here. Well, while you're looking at this, and I know this is kind of related, uh, Joseph has a question in the chat. He says, uh, do you have any specific reasons for leaning toward this combination of software and take technique versus others? Yeah, I will say like the iPad Pro is a game changer for me personally, for whatever reason. I mean, one big thing, honestly, is that I have I've had repetitive stress issues in my arm for like five or six years at this point. And I've like had physical therapy for and it's literally just from being on the computer all the time. Like I injured it in like 2015 and I'm still dealing with it now. So take breaks and like do exercise cause it sucks so badly. But like the problem, like I, it is really hard for me to sit on the computer all the time always and like, or have the posture to be working on my Cintiq. I had that big clunky old one from forever ago. So someday I wanna get like a nice thin one like on an arm, whatever, but that's not anytime soon. But I just like physically can't really do it as much. And like working on the iPad gives me a lot more flexibility to to just like sit around. And when they put in the animation stuff, I was just like, this is so amazing. Like, please just make an iPad that's like 16 inches and add timelines to procreate. And like, I'll be doing this in my spare time, like all the time forever. I would definitely be like trying harder to make it more of a career thing. It's just easy. And like, Photoshop has this too, but like if I if I do a bunch of rough animation in Procreate and I play it back, it's just like instant. And then I can change so easily how many frames are happening at once and like what's the frame rate. And it's just so easy to play it back and see like, I could see a lot of motion designers who are not even doing a ton of cell stuff, but you can do something rough really fast in Procreate and then bring it into After Effects and like trace over it with shape layers or something like that. It's just like such a fast way of working. That's very appealing to me. Um, but again, if I if somebody like dropped a uh, Cintiq in my lap, I would definitely take it. But I just don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. I know I got these storyboards in here somewhere, y'all. I know I do. They might be, oh, you know what? They might be in their own file but i do i think it would be cool to see that thank you for taking the time to answer the question appreciate it yeah thank you so much oh okay we're in it now boom i knew they were in here somewhere so you can see this is like really rough and weird I have like my placeholder title card. This is just like a still that I made from Procreate and I was trying to figure out what I wanted it to look like because I didn't know. I had like a wave warp flag thing in here. Oh, this is like, um. so the flag I made in Cinema 4D and then I rotoscoped it in Procreate because are you kidding? Look at this. Like, I don't, I'm not, I don't have the brain energy to like make this work just all out of the iPad, there's no way. So that was another cool thing. I was like, well, I want it to look really dynamic, but I want it to be in the style of the rest of the stuff. So I just like cheated in Cinema 4D and then traced it over it. But this was basically the very, very basics of me testing out timing and then also like look and feel. And I have like a few different versions where it got more complicated over time. That's all it takes. And then I was just like, I don't know, I'll have the bird. I'll have a bunch of birds show up instead of just this one as I was going along until I felt like it was done. And that's that's it. Very nice. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank um, you. Joseph has another question if you have another minute for oh, us. Yeah. Uh, he asks, what is something you learned during the switch to the iPad that you wish you knew from the beginning? Oh man. 
Um, I have a question. And is that like just when I first started using the iPad at all or when I started using the iPad for animation stuff? Maybe that's the same thing. I think I just wish I'd known, honestly, I wish I'd known that Procreate was so awesome earlier because I really regretted not getting an iPad sooner. And I'm not paid by Apple to say that. I just personally find it so pleasurable to use. I know some people don't like the glass surface, like drawing on it. It doesn't bother me at all. I don't know why, but I know that there's like um, screen protectors you can get and stuff to maybe make it feel a little bit better, but I just love I it. I do have like, one of those screen protectors. Do you I like it? Like cheap, yeah, I like it a lot. I just got the cheapy one on Amazon. I didn't get like the really nice paper yeah. uh, company one, but it's it's weird. Like when you're using it without your pencil, it kind of like makes you feel like you have dry hands. Um, <laughs> like you're you need lotion or something. It's like it got this weird texture to it. But when you're drawing on it, it's huge game changer. That's super interesting. I do want to try one at some point, I think, but. There's something about the glass kind I kind of enjoy. I don't know. That's just a personal preference thing, I guess. But there was like a, I guess every artist probably goes through phases where you're not doing art as much. And like when I got the iPad, it was like after a long run of like never drawing anymore, which really bums me out. And when I first got it, which was a couple years ago at this point, I drew on it every day for like months. It just was so much easier, like really inspired me a lot. And it was so I like playing with all the brushes and everything, which if I'm going to be shilling here, um, the Max Pack brushes that are on Gumroad are really, really cool and relatively inexpensive. Like some of them are more, but there's one essential pack you can get for $2 um, with just a bunch of different stuff in there. I'm totally obsessed with this guy's brushes. They're all really fun to use. I use them for pretty much everything now. I use them for like when I'm storyboarding for work and stuff like that. So I totally recommend. The the brush system, I won't pretend to understand it super duper well because I don't make brushes, but like in Photoshop, I never wanted to mess with the brush settings. It just felt like a little bit like a headache to me. And in Procreate, if I want to go in and adjust something about the brushes, it's really easy and intuitive. For I can't quite like quantify that, but there's just something in the the brush engine that Procreate uses that I'm like, I can just go in here and like do this one slider, and I immediately see what it's doing, and it's perfect. And it's just a little bit easier for me to wrap my head around. Like a lot of my other kind of cell inclined friends are like. Photoshop is over, like I'll never use it again if I can just like only use Procreate for stuff. So look out Photoshop, I guess. Well, well it seems like uh, we don't have any more questions unless anybody has the last thing they want to throw in the chat. Uh, but while we're waiting for that to see if that happens, uh, Caitlin, thank you so much for showing your process. Uh, think it's totally fair to say that everyone here saw something that they picked up and you're getting lots of applause from you, the peanut gallery back here. <laughs> I mean, thank you for asking me. It was a pleasure. It's like, yeah, it's, it's fun. So, and if you're ever out in, you know, twin cities, uh, you know, if you God miss Sunday. If you want more snow and more cold for some reason, you can come out here and say hi and you'll get a warm welcome. Yeah. So. That would be my immense pleasure. Honestly, hopefully I will get a chance to do that someday, someday. Or we'll all just have to go out to, you know, East Coast. And yeah, if you guys ever want to do a fun little retreat, Troy, New York. I'm only three hours from where they had Camp Mograph last time in Vermont. So it's practically right next door. <laughs> and last year. So yeah, two years ago. <laughs> I mean, we're from the Midwest. We'd rather drive 14 hours than jump on an airplane. So, you know. Yeah, like it's no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll just head four hours away for the cabin for the weekend. You know, whatever. It's no, no big. <laughs> So cool. Well, thank you so much uh, again, like from all of us, we really appreciate you showing your process and that, that was really awesome to see. So uh, that is Caitlin, everybody. Thank you so much. And if you do want to know any more, obviously feel free to reach out. If you do hit me up on Twitter, I'll see it eventually. I just am not checking <laughs> it for the time being, but I'm at KCAD. You whenever, like we're truly like, you can ask me anything if you want to, or if you think of stuff later, or whatever, you know, I'm available. <laughs> yeah, D&D &D is really good. 
Rude yeah. Tales of Magic is a great podcast also. I mean, it's not, it's very colorful. I'll say that. Like, it's not kid appropriate. I have to ask, have you checked out the Adventure Zone podcast? Yes. <laughs> I, will say, I used to love the Adventure Zone because, like, I don't really listen to it so much these days anymore, tragically. But the first campaign for the Adventure Zone, like, was really important <clears throat> to me. I loved it. I still love it. It's so good. I actually have listened to Dungeons and Daddies a little bit too, but I not a lot, but I need to, I enjoyed what I heard. <laughs> also the um, Brennan Lee Mulligan stuff on like Roll20 or whatever, what is it called? I don't know. He has a show. Anyway, people Critical. who like me talk to me after. <laughs> Critical Role, is that what you were thinking? No, I actually haven't seen Critical Role or listened to it, either one. My, I think I got, it's too intimidating. Like it's so long and people love it so much that I was like, I don't know where to begin. The fan base is quite, what's the word? Fever dream? I don't know. Just around. <laughs> my dad really likes Critical Role, but that's like, my dad and I have a lot of the same tastes and stuff. So like, I should probably check it out, but I just, I just have it. I think it's drop 20, but that doesn't sound like anything. And if I Google it, it's definitely not that. <laughs> also this month's, uh, Digital Meetup is brought to you by Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, next month, we'll be uh, sponsored by Wizards of the Coast, and we'll be talking about Magic the Gathering. So <laughs> no, I, I will get into Like, I have so many friends that play D&D now. Like, it's only a matter of time before I, I'm sucked in. I can't believe you haven't done it yet. I, I did it once, like, so long ago. And I have a couple buddies that are trying to get me in, but then, you know, 2020 happened and that kind of stopped. So. Yeah. So it was the perfect year to pick up a D20. True. I do, I, I do have a set of dice from like, you know, a D4 through a D20 and like the D10s that have like the uh, every 10 numbers and everything. So I don't know why I have it, but I do. <laughs> I'm a little surprised. And on, there's so many internet dice out there these days. Yeah. You can even uh, do it in Slack. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you could do it in Slack. I bet there's a D and D Slack that you can like totally run the whole campaign out of. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so before we run out of too much time for the night, uh, I did want to talk about the February prompt that we have. Uh, and if you're unfamiliar with it, uh, we're trying to do every month. We at the beginning we put out a uh, prompt and some guidelines, a color palette, and let you kind of have at it and make something. Um, it was a little late notice this month, so we have two uh, to show. So we are going to take a look at Hannah's and Jill's, and the prompt is warmth because you know we're just rounding the corner of winter, and we're all looking forward to being warm. Are we? There we go. It's oh, loading okay. now. <laughs> there we go. So this is, is Hannah's. Hannah, do you have anything you'd like to uh, say about it while we're kind of letting it play through here? Is Hannah here? I mean, I don't know. I don't have anything really to say. <laughs> Too I real, Hannah. <laughs> Too real. I do have to say, like, there's some really nice moments in here that I like, and I get to control the screen, so I'm going to talk about it. But just like some of the uh, the squash and stretch and some of the motion trails you got in here like feel really nice and uh it, it, everything works really well with the color palette and like the old timey music i love i love the sun just like is not having it but then too bad <laughs> and somehow snow falls on top of the sun <laughs> yeah i actually made this project um i was kind of killing two birds with one stone i was like man i really don't have enough time to do this prompt because I'm doing all this freelance and teaching at the same time. But then I thought, well, when I was in college, I really would have loved to actually dig through an actual After Effects project. I never had that opportunity in college. so. And we were talking about squash and stretch and arcs. So, <laughs> well, might as well make a project for my students to be able to dig through. So, yeah. Kayla yeah. was actually asking how you did the motion trails in there. Oh, the motion trails? Um, yeah, I didn't. 
<laughs> Problem solved. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not so much a, a frame by frame person, so I just grabbed some. Uh, uh, it was an animation composer, Liquid Trails. You know what though? That's a valid. There. That's valid as heck. It's integrating that stuff sometimes makes stuff like a lot better than it would be otherwise. I mean, if the work's done by somebody else, yep. yeah. <laughs> I didn't have a lot of time. <laughs> that's also realistic and like good information for students to have. Honestly, it's like that's how work gets done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, thanks, Anna, for uh, for submitting. Uh, sure thing. Appreciate appreciate the effort that always goes into them. Uh, so now we'll take a look at Jill's. I believe has, uh, and hopefully, can you see this tab this time? Yes. It'd be a YouTube yeah. page. Okay. Yeah, it's been over a year and we're still like, can you see my screen? Am I doing it right? <laughs> I do kind of like this, especially since uh, my dog and my cat both are doing the same thing right now. Like as soon as the heat kicks in, they just lay down in front of the vent. So Jill, are you still around? Yep, I'm here. Hey. Uh, yeah. What, so what made you decide to go with some pets for this one? Just looking at my real life, looking straight <laughs> at my desk. But I do have a question. I would have, if I would have known how to do this quickly, like to animate the spiral, like the curl of the tail unwinding because that's what she does when she's upset but i couldn't figure out like a quick way to do that does anybody have like any tips of how you would animate a like a curl unwinding frame by frame <laughs> that's probably the answer there is no quick way yeah i, I think well isn't there a way you could create a point with a repeater and then spiral it with a repeater? I don't know for sure. I'm just, I think you might be able to do it with a repeater. I, I will. Think you're right. You might be able to in After Effects, yeah. Like depending on how you really dense. Yeah. yeah. I will look that up. Oh, that makes total sense. I never thought of that. I'll look that up. I've done where like I have, I would have like different artwork layers for the tail so like one would be the curved one would be the tween and then another would be the full extend and i would also break that up into different chunks and then i've done something similar to this in the past where like i have null objects be at each of those connector points mm -hmm. and then i just have the null objects anchored to a parent null at the bottom of the screen and i like through the position of changing those nulls like you get that motion yeah. and then I do a bunch of like smear shapes in between to okay. budget. I think we got a combination too, because I think using that like the uh like what Joseph is saying in the chat that to draw it straight and then curl it with an AE. And then Angel is saying do it with a puppet tool. And I think that like then using nulls to control those puppet pins, like all together, <laughs> I, I think we could figure this out. Yeah, because parenting nulls and um you know doing the rotation on all of those I think would be a good way to get uh a nice spiral out of that. The puppet tool though will do some funky things if you push it too far. And I, I so I don't know what a curl will do, but the only way to find out is to try. So All right. <laughs> there's also a free script. I'm trying to remember what it's called, uh path follows null or null follow mm. path or something that'll actually give you tangent control as well. Yeah. Which could help with the curling. That's one thing like I really like that uh the After Effects team did that is they made they enabled this feature in, in expressions uh, to uh, control path uh, Bezier paths, and then they included the script, but they they left the source open. Like anyone can open that script, and if you know scripting, you can actually play with it and add to it. And so they're yeah, like some some other people are doing that where you actually get uh, tangent controls and things like that. Uh, Roto Bezier uh, paths are also a good way to do that because then you don't have paths to or, uh, handles to worry about. It's just points. And they all kind of uh, automatically curve on their own. So I think 
lots of ways to do that. Um, Bo says Wayfinder. I, as the maker of that tool, I'm going to say that probably won't <laughs> be the right one. But hey, thanks for pitching it. I swear I didn't pay him to do that. So. <laughs> Uh, Joseph says there is a literal twirl effect. Uh, so I think we're getting to lots of ways to, to accomplish this. And that's, I think, what After Effects is. It's a million ways to do something and no one way is right. <laughs> There's <laughs> always lots of pitfalls in each one. Duik is another one. That's right. Duik has like a, uh, some uh, automatic rigging tools that might do some of that too. I don't know how many of you follow Duik, but they also have a walk cycle button. So there's literally a button now for walk I cycle. I for the first time a couple months ago, and it was magic. Yeah. It saved weeks of my sanity. By... Like, it took me a little while to, like, get the rigging correct. And that's why, like, I always have an After Effects file that's, like, pre-rig and post-rig. <laughs> um, but, yeah, you can literally have just walking with a button now. <clears throat> The thing that clients think has existed is it finally starting to happen. It, it's as close as you're going to get to the animate button. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then you might have missed it, Paul, but uh, Adam did put another link to a warmth prompt oh, submission. I'm going to scroll back. All right. I'm opening it up. I'm putting in a tab. I'm zooming in a little bit. Now I'm going to share it. And we're going to watch Adam's. Uh, warmth. I want to do by Adam. Play there. by play there was was just titillizing. All right, let's take a look. People can't see it, right? Last time Vimeo. Correct. <laughs> it did not work for me. You know, I got to say, I'm loving how simple this is. And it took me like five seconds, but then, oh, nice. Oh, snap. Like, the oh, real. Yeah, I'm really liking this, Adam. Do you have anything you want to uh, say about it out loud if you're still here or in the chat if you want to? Yeah, I, so just that this is like, uh, I always learn this where you should start with an idea and then like, animate it out as opposed to starting with an attempt to animate something and then figure out the idea halfway. <laughs> so like in terms of like the typography and not leaving enough room for the H really. Um, but yeah, no, um, just playing around kind of at my ability level. <laughs> I'm really like, I, li I like the line boil, no pun intended, uh, <laughs> going on as you get later on. And then when, honestly, when you brought this in, like there's such a cool look to that like very narrow uh, letter form in here that's very stretched out. I really like it. And also like Jill said, just looking at what's in my house, looking at what's in front of me. <laughs> yeah, I think at this point, like that, that's the inspiration we have, right? Is whatever's within the five feet from us. <laughs> So cool. Well, uh, yeah, thanks so much, uh, Adam, for tossing out there and for uh, from Jill and Hannah, too. Uh, thanks for sharing your work and taking the time to do it. We'll put out another prompt uh, towards the beginning of March. If anybody has ideas for uh, prompt words, feel free to uh, post in Facebook or Discord or send emails, carrier pigeons, text messages, whatever works for you. All right. Um, so. Next on our agenda, we have uh, show and tell, which is our time to, uh, for anybody really, if you have something to show or you have something that you have a question on, you want some help with, uh, it's, it's your time to uh, to shine, really, if you want to. Uh, I know this is kind of an, an awkward time at times because not everyone wants to have something. We're sitting here and like, does anyone want to show? Uh, but if you do, Feel free to take over the mic. Uh, while that's happening, Joseph asked for the Discord link, so I'm going to dig that up. Uh, alternatively, if no one wants to show and they have a question about something that they want to post to the group, you could put that in the chat as well. Now we get the lovely awkward pause while we wait for somebody to. This is say the part where. This is the part where we edit out. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I did post the Discord link in there, uh, and that should get you right in if you want to join the Minnesota After Effects Discord. On my way. <laughs> Mark, are you playing guitar while you're in this After Effects meeting? <laughs> You know, one thing that, that I do have a lot of problems with is I'll want to import one comp into the next comp. And the dependencies thing brings in all this extra stuff that I don't need at all. And I'm it's I'm doing sorting again, trying to find out like what am I doing wrong here where I keep importing stuff that has nothing to do with the comp that I was originally trying to import into the next comp. Are you referring to like a project file or like nesting a comp itself? Let's just say I, I made um, an effect I like or a simple animation of like a little logo sting. And mm -hmm. I want to import that into a different project I'm working on because it's a corporate font. Mm -hmm. So I go into the select comp, go down to dependencies and collect that one comp for output. So mm -hmm. it brings all the stuff in. And I go back to the project that I was working on to import it in. And then it starts bringing all these extra solids and things and nulls that have nothing to do with the animation that I originally imported. Yeah, I got to say, like, I've had, like, doing dependencies and collecting for just the comp that's selected. I have had bad luck with that, too. Like, it ends up, I feel like it ends up saving the whole project sometimes, but then sometimes it works fine. Okay. Uh, so it's not just me. I, I don't think so unless anybody else wants to pipe up. I will post a link. Um, I thought this was a pay what you want script, but there's a script called uh, Save Compass Project that uh, an After Effects in a script that basically does what you want. You select your comp and it saves a new project with just that. I don't think it does any collecting by default, um, but that's at least the version I have, which I think is version one, not version two, has been fairly solid for me. Um, Otherwise, you know, the nice thing is it does import just the whole project as a folder. So you, it's tedious <laughs> as hell, but you can go through and, you know, uh, delete stuff fairly easily and know exactly where it is. Awesome. Okay. Angel suggesting reducing the project before exporting, uh, which is another way I think um, as long as I would save a copy of your project file before you do that, just because one, sometimes once you end up doing that collect and uh, everything, you can end up like blowing away your undo stack, and then suddenly you have a project file that's empty, <laughs> except for that one thing. I've done that before. Lesson yeah. learned. <laughs> <laughs> Did that the hard way, yep. Yeah. Caitlin says she saves a, a copy of her project to the desktop, not the original path, and then it makes you save it, and you could reduce it there. Sorry okay. for making you read that out loud when I was like. <laughs> <laughs> and then it reduces the same file. I can just save it. <laughs> But yeah, just getting it out of there because it makes you save and like you don't want to save over your your file, which I have done. So yeah, I yeah. always take it out of the original folder structure and like put it on my desktop. So then I can just delete that too later. But like that's mostly been good. But I always end up having to, when I do that, it'll like import the solids layer and everything. And I literally just take everything that's in that folder and put it into the main solids folder and then delete the copy it made because I just can't stand that but like yep. yeah. i think yeah there's always going to be a little bit of crud that comes in for whatever reason yeah another thing i'll do is i'll just delete all of the other comps that might be in that project file and then i'll just go to dependencies and delete unused and then it uh takes care of a lot of that for me what sucks though is if i have my lovely folder structure in place and there's a couple folders that i haven't put something into yet and all of a sudden those folders are are gone but small price to pay to save myself a little sanity, I guess. If you're trying to collect, I'm not the only one. <laughs> if you're trying to collect something that has like a ton of files in it, like EXR or something like that, um, sometimes my files will be like 20 gigs or something, something huge. <laughs> so you can go to the folder actually in like your Explorer and change the name of it, and then everything will turn out missing in your After Effects file. So then you can mm -hmm. you go to collect it. It doesn't collect all the XRs that you don't need, you might need them again later, and then you can just rename the folder or something. But if you're just trying to reduce the project down, that's one way to do it is change the file names of folders in your Explorer or something. That's so. a great idea. Thank you. Yeah. All, yep. the, all these wonderful hacks to make After Effects work the way we want to. <laughs> we love Adobe. 
I feel that one would like just make so much sense. It works in InDesign, works in Elsevier. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. Um, working, like, mm. I mean, it might it might be worth if you're if you're noticing that it's not working right. Um, it, it really is worth like posting a bug uh, a bug report to their user voice forums, and uh, I know Adobe gets a bad rap, uh, but truly the After Effects team is a small team, and they do care. Like they they do take a look at that stuff, and um, I know people have been reached out to, and they've submitted project files, and they do some digging. Uh, so sometimes you have to get lucky that they catch it at the right time. But you know, if enough people are running into this, they'll raise the the visibility of that bug report, and hopefully it'll get taken care of. So I do have to like uh, I do like Joseph's comment here: strategically break it so it can easily be fixed again, just in case. It's a really great way to put it. <laughs> yep. That is a good way. So do you have any other uh, questions or help that anybody would like to show or talk about? I could keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, I'll tell you what. We'll, we'll, make, the, we'll make the April After Effects meetup uh, just you, and we'll all... <laughs> <laughs> we'll all be here to help you out. No, but if you do have problems too, like the Facebook group and Discord are, gr are great uh, places to get people. Uh, Discord tends to get some relatively quick responses, at least within the day. I know, Hannah, you had some questions that got answered about expressions and everything this week. So it's uh, we're, we're a good group of people. Yeah, the Discord is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, since we're done now with uh, show and tell just a really quick or actually let me uh, export the attendees and uh, get that going um, but before we go too far uh, I did want to talk about what we're going to do next month and this is uh, a little I don't want to say last minute but we just kind of are starting to get stuff confirmed like today so this is uh, <laughs> hot off the presses but um, Next month, we'll, we're going to have a meetup on March 25th, so it's five weeks from today. And we are going to cover expressions. Uh, so Hannah, your question was very well-timed uh, in the Discord group. And we are going to have an awesome guest by the name of Zach Lovett, who co-teaches the School of Motion course on expressions. Uh, he's also a really friendly Canadian uh, guy, uh, <laughs> super, just super awesome, uh, and will fall over himself to try to help people. So we're gonna, uh, he's gonna be presenting kind of like Caitlin did today for you know half hour, 45 minutes. Uh, he's gonna have something for every skill level. So if you've never touched expressions before, you will learn something. If you've been coding expressions for a while, uh, you'll probably still learn a few things because we're gonna do a couple intermediate and advanced uh, tips too. And we're also gonna have a prize drawing at the end. And we're still working out the details of what that is and how you're gonna win it. What I will say is that it's probably gonna be an awesome prize. And we are going to do uh, a slightly different way of entering. It's not just going to be random for whoever's here. So it will be, uh, even if you're not here, you will have a chance to win it uh, next month. So that is Zach. And uh, I don't know if anybody knows Zach already um, or has seen him on Twitter or anything. I don't know. I I'm buying time while I'm copying names, really. <laughs> um, and just like today, uh, we do want to continue to do three one ones where three people present one thing. Mm -hmm. um, so if you like the group and if you have like a little nuanced trick or tip that you want to share, we would love and we would really, really love for you guys to, you know, be part of the presentations because we don't want it to be the Paul and Tara show all the time. Like <laughs> our group is for you and we want to see you guys like speak your voice and contribute. So it doesn't have to be anything complicated, but if you've got like one little thing, we'd love to show it and have you speak about it. Yeah, and just to, to piggyback off that too, like seriously, I mean, you you many of you have been here before, even if you knew you've watched Caitlin's uh, demonstration or the, the quick tips that we had at the beginning. You know, we have a very wi uh, wide range of skill sets and experience in our group. And so even if you think something is like super basic, chances are it's something somebody doesn't know. So share the knowledge, share, share the wealth. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, uh, 
I'm going to share my screen. We have two giveaways to give away. Uh, the first we're going to do is uh, a year of After Effects, or not After Effects, of Creative Cloud. So uh, it, it's a big one. And we'll do that first just because then we don't run into the thing of like somebody wins the lesser prize and like, do they want to give it up so that they can have the bigger one? No, we're just going to do the bigger one right away. And we did this, uh, where's my tab? We did this uh, last time. Does everyone see our wheel of names? Your wheel of names is on screen, Paul. We did this last time. It's just kind of fun. It's very full this time, which is uh, which is pretty awesome. A uh, couple of quick things before we spin this wheel for the year of Creative Cloud. Um, if you are on, <laughs> Matt's saying spin it. Um, if you're on an enterprise uh, or a Teams account, I do not think it will work. This is just going to be for personal accounts. Um, so if I do spin this and you are not eligible, like you have a just have a work account, um, or you just want to pass on to the next person, please let me know right away because then we can get somebody uh, get somebody their chance. So we're gonna spin it. <laughs> Matt says he's chanting. Does it go along? And it looks like Wendy. With I don't know if you can hear the applause, but Wendy, are you still here? When uh, anybody, Wendy? She is still here. She's muted. So Wendy, at the bottom of your screen, you should see a microphone button to unmute yourself. It could also be Control D on a PC or Command D on a Mac. It's also like kids' bedtime time, so maybe they yeah. are just like away from this. <laughs> I mean, Wendy is signed in. So what we'll do is, Wendy, if you can hear us wherever you are, uh, you are the proud winner of uh, Creative Cloud for a year. Uh, we will work on getting a hold of you as best we can. If uh, And if for some reason Wendy decides to turn it down, we will respin and let the next person know uh, somehow. <laughs> Joseph says, kids' bedtime is when I look over my daughter's shoulder. Congrats. Uh, <laughs> so we'll move on then to uh, Time Lord. And if you're not familiar with Time Lord, I know uh, Caitlin did a really great job of plugging it with, uh, I bought it, but I've never used it. However, I'm the same. <laughs> so I can't complain about that too much. Uh, but if you have not seen Time Lord, uh, it's basically a another way to use like an overlord like functionality but with cell animation and with photoshop and animate or flash as uh it used to be known but it's uh let's just do a quick scroll through here and we'll post the link again but it's a, a great way of getting layers as png sequences or swifts um and it also gives you a uh a toolbar kind of like uh, animators toolbar pro that gives you some nice features in here. What's nice is that it, I haven't touched Animate or Flash in a very long time, but I remember feeling like these functions were kind of missing when I was playing with it. And I always felt like I was fighting uh, Flash to get it to do what I wanted to. So even I feel like even if just for this toolbar, it's kind of nice to have. Um, but then just being able to spit out uh, things easily back and forth between uh, Photoshop and, uh, and uh, After Effects. And it looks like here too, you can even go from After Effects to give you an MP4 reference to then animate over in Photoshop pretty easily, which would be a nice uh, nice thing to do. So we're going to switch back over. And we're going to spin our wheel of names for, when, uh, for Time Lord. And let's see what we come up with. And it's David. Aha. Leroy Jenkins. <laughs> so David, do I, I see you here this time. Do you accept your prize of Time Lord? I accept. And it looks like Wendy's back too. She panicked and instead of unmuting, kicked herself out of the meetup. Oh no. <laughs> so Wendy, you're back. Welcome, welcome back. You you won a year of Creative Cloud. <laughs> uh so that's uh, that. That's it for our meetup at this point. Um, 
Wendy and David, if you wouldn't mind hanging back at the end, uh, just so that we can get some of your info. But uh, I really want to thank again, Caitlin, for coming out and sharing your time with us. I, I know it's uh, it's getting late. It would be late for me, at least, if I was on the West Coast lately. I've been falling asleep at like 9 o'clock at night. Almost 10 p.m. I went to bed at 9.30 last night, so what but else am I doing? hard. <laughs> yeah, like what else is going on? Nothing. <laughs> Uh, but Caitlin, thank you so much for sharing uh, your workflow knowledge. Uh, David, Tara, and uh, Lucas, thank you so much for sharing your quick tips. Uh, David and Wendy, congratulations on your prizes. And don't forget, uh, five weeks from today, March 25th, we are going to have uh, our expressions uh, topic. And we're going to bug you a lot if you're in our uh, various social groups because we're gonna start collecting uh, questions that you might have about expressions and then uh, your experience levels. And I'm gonna get those over to Zach so that he can uh, hopefully answer some of those directly and kind of tailor it to the, the audience that we're gonna have here. So, I mean, that's it. I, I would say go home, but most of you probably already are home. So, <laughs> so go get a beer? <laughs> go, go get a beer or another one. Bye everybody. Thanks <laughs> All for right. having me. Bye, everybody. All right. Thanks, Caitlin, again.